1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly. How many of you realize you're, you're seeing, you're looking, but you have like these glasses on, like sunglasses, and you're seeing through a glass darkly, but then the Bible says face to face. We're talking about face to face with Jesus. It says face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known meaning when you see Jesus you're gonna have a, a vision of him and how are you gonna see him you're gonna see him face to face revelations describes his eyes and the Bible says he has eyes like flames of fire what is that that's a light that's the revelation of the light in him is light and there's no darkness at all that when you look and you see Jesus you're gonna see the revelation of not only who he is but you're gonna see and understand who you are and you're gonna understand everything around you you know the Bible says we'll become just as he is but now now we see through a glass darkly you know my mom a couple of weeks ago you know we celebrated her home going and and I told you I cried for just a little bit but not for very long why because her eyes have seen Jesus she's been changed man she is in the presence and the power and the glory of God she's walking upon not only the streets of gold she's in God's presence you know sometimes we 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 focus on oh those streets of gold Gold is nothing in heaven. Gold is pavement in heaven. What is powerful is the presence of God. You know, sometimes we say things like, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see my grandmother. <laughs> well, you will see her after you see Jesus. Believe me, the glory, the power, the splendor, the awe of heaven. And again, I love to, to speak on heaven briefly. Heaven's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen because there's absolutely no chaos in heaven. In heaven, a thousand songs can play at the same time and you understand every one of them. In heaven, you're going to see colors you've never dreamed, you've never imagined. Why? Because there's no confusion, there's no chaos. And when you get to heaven, there's going to be a light that lights up heaven. And the Bible says that Jesus is that light. And whether you're facing this way or you're facing that way, you're always facing the light. You're always facing Him. And when you get to heaven, the first thing you're going to want to see in the midst of that glory, in the midst of that beautiful city is not going to be the streets made out of gold it's not going to be your grandmother although you know praise God for a great grandmama thank you for for my mama but somebody show me Jesus hey amen when I get to heaven I want to see Jesus hey amen I'll see my mom and and we'll walk on those streets and it's going to be absolutely amazing and wonderful but show me Jesus but as of now, right now, where we are, where you are, where we are right now, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, but as it is written, it says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. For God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. God's not trying to keep it a secret from you. But God is hiding it for you. You see, right now, I has not seen. I don't know about heaven. I know by the revelation of the word of God. I know the revelation of Jesus. I know, but I haven't seen. My eye hasn't seen. My ear hasn't heard. But we've all got glimpses. You see, the Spirit is to lead us into those things. The Spirit is not trying to keep it a secret. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is trying to share with you, tell you, lead you, guide you, show you bits of Jesus, bits of heaven, bits of glory, because we're being changed. And how does God change us? He likes to change us, the Bible says, from glory to glory. Now, that's quite different than being changed from failure to failure. But if that's the only way you can change, then God be it. He loves you whether you succeed or fail. But he would much rather have you succeed. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. You know, uh, I'm, you know, reaching this point in my life where I'm getting a lot closer with a lot of my high school friends. And, you know, every single one of them, every single one of them is a born-again Christian now. Every single, they're like, you aren't crazy after all. 
You know, I was that crazy preacher kid in high school, you know, and they, they loved me and they respected me. They had to, but they didn't understand me. And now they're like, now we get it. How many of you think that at least with some maturity that we learn some stuff? Amen. Amen. We grow. And now eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, but God is revealing them by His Spirit. What is that? That's the face-to-face -face look. The face-to-face -face look. We have our, our grandchild, uh, baby Russell. He's here with us today. And so... His mama let us keep him for a little while. She's expecting another baby. He was born January 2nd this year. She's expecting her next baby on Christmas Day on the 25th or 26th. And so she probably just needs a breather. <laughs> She's fixing to have another one. She's about to pop. And so we're keeping little baby Russell. But I'm going to tell you, whenever I get his attention, what I must do is I must get face to face with him. How many of you know babies are distracted by a lot of stuff? And we have, this is our thing, it's our thing, not Anne's thing, it's our thing. Anne tries to steal it from me, but it's not her thing, it's my thing, okay? And my thing is that we look eye to eye, and then we nod and our foreheads hit each other. And then we just look at each other. I know I got his 100% attention. And so that's face to face. How many of you, you believe this, know this, trust this? That sometimes God wants to get your forehead, and he wants to put his forehead down on your forehead, and he wants to look eyeball to eyeball. I got your attention now, boy. I got it. Because the Bible says as we see him, we become more like him. You're going to follow what your eyes follow. Wherever your head looks, that's where you're going to look. And so the scripture says and prophesies, even of John the Baptist, it says in Matthew 11, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face. God says, I'm going to send a messenger. How many of you know that God loved us so much that he sent his own son before our face? You know, the apostle John, he was the youngest of all the disciples. And of course, he's the only one that lived and, and died of natural causes. He was on the Isle of Patmos. He wrote the wonderful book of Revelations, which is not really the book of Revelations. It's the revelation of Jesus. And John, who was the oldest at the time, most of these guys had already passed away. John is still living when he writes the book of John. You know, the, the book of John, it, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible story. And in the book of John... He speaks of Jesus and he speaks of God as the Father more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke do combined because he's now an old man. Why did he write this book? Well, because at that time, and you know and understand this, how rumors, how people talk, that they were already starting to say Jesus never existed. There wasn't a Jesus. Of course, they crucified him. He's in history books. He, and John said, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait just a minute. He said, I touched the face of God. I was there. I saw him. I touched him. I walked with him. I saw the revelation of the glory that came down as a man. And what's so interesting about this is today, we actually have a man in the Godhead, Jesus Christ. He was fully God and he was fully man. Let me tell you, you have representation because he loved you so much to put a face on and to come and get in front of you. And so the scripture says about John, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. You know, John preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready. He's baptizing people. And then all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, who's actually his cousin. But John had never seen or had never met Jesus up until this time. And all of a sudden, he said, behold, he said, the perfect lamb of God. Here's the one that takes away our sins. Jesus wanted to be baptized. John said, no, man, I, I need to be baptized of you and then John baptized him and the, a, a voice came out of heaven which said this is my son in whom I'm well pleased well Jesus hadn't done any miracles he hadn't done anything but God said he was pleased how many of you realize you don't have to do something to be pleasing because God sees your future Amen. I sent this to somebody this week. 
because they were mad at me because I was being mean to them. And uh, I sent this quote that, uh, that uh, one of the, I think, I think it was Nick Saban said it. He said, I coach the person you can become, not the person that you are. How many of you know that you're, you need to go up to a new level? What God's doing is he's not putting you down. He's bringing you up because he's coaching you and what he sees in you. He's coaching you to your performance and your level. But he'll take you just like you are. But what we do is we get distracted. We get distracted. We quit. You know, I promise you, January, the first week of January, the gym is going to be fuller than it has ever been. And two weeks later, most of those people will not be coming back. Why? They take their eyes off of their goal. I have hanging on the back of my door, and I brought it from the old church, so I've had this like over 20 years. You would never see it because it's taped to the back of my door. And so I see it every single day. I close my door and I see it. And it's the best definition of discipline that I've ever heard in my life. Discipline is nothing more than remembering what you want. Remembering what you want. Because what happens when we lose discipline is we forget what we want. You remember that diet you went on and all of a sudden you forgot Oh, well, I want to lose 10 pounds. And then two days later, you forgot. And you're eating two pounds of pie. You know, that's me. I love pie. We have to remember. How's the best way to remember? The best way to remember is to keep it in front of your face. Amen. Keep it in front of you. Keep Jesus in front of your face. In Matthew 16, Jesus said you can discern the face of the sky. You can look into the face and you can see things. In Matthew 17, when Jesus was transfigured, the Bible says his face did shine. Now, can you imagine, you know, one of the disciples, uh, one of the inner three, going up on that mountain and all of a sudden Jesus levitates up in the air and he begins to glow and just the glory of God and he comes back down and he says, don't tell anybody you saw this. Can you imagine that? His face began to shine. Why? Because there's glory in the face. There's power in the face. In 2 Corinthians 3.18 it says, But we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image. How are we changed? From glory to glory. To glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God is changing us. But the key is we all with what? With an open face. How many of you know that sometimes we hide our face? Sometimes we disguise our face. And the Bible says every one of us with an open face are going to be changed. Now I'm leading on to a theme to get to where I'm preaching. I'm still not there yet. But in Genesis chapter 18, it says the men turn their faces toward Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham stood still. Now, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was a, a completely sexually explicit city. It wasn't just homosexuality. It was, it was everything you can imagine. Bestiality, sexuality, it was more than you can just imagine. And, and what happened, sometimes as men, we're led by our eyes. And what happened was the men began to set their face. You see, they set their face toward Sodom before their feet ever entered. But what does it say about Abraham? It says Abraham stood still. He didn't set his face towards it. You see, those things that we put before us are those things that generally we find ourselves going after. If I can just remember I want to lose 10 pounds and I can keep that before me every day, I can lose 10 pounds. But as soon as I put pie in front of my face, <laughs> the diet is over. And which I came off of my diet this week, and I'm going to be off of it next week, and I'll be back on it the week after that. Why? Because when it's a party time, Jesus said, if the bridegroom's here, he said, don't fast. It's, it's time to eat. Amen? How many of y'all know there's a time to eat, there's a time to fast, there's a time to be on a diet, and fasting and dieting is not the same thing. <laughs> so don't, don't claim that. You go on a little diet and you call it a fast. It's not a fast. You're just fat and you need to lose weight. But when you do it for God, it's an entirely different thing. 
But you know what? Whenever I lose weight, what I have to do is I have to keep my goal in front of me. Whenever I fast, I have to keep Jesus in front of me. Amen? You know, I may have a diet, and I don't even pray about my diet, meaning I have the willpower, I have the discipline, I know to do it. But when I'm fasting, I better be praying. I better be seeking Jesus. Amen? I know this is good stuff, but... Abraham controlled his gaze. Now, we're going to look at, before I enter in, and I'm not going to keep you real long today, which you know, that may, may surprise you, but I'm not, but i got to set this up right, okay? In 2 Chronicles 29, verse 6, it says, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Okay, this is the repeated story through the Old Testament over and over. You know the same story. When everything's going good, when everything is going God, we get away, we fall away, and then when we stumble, when we fall, the best thing we can do, and please don't ever feel guilty, for calling and coming right back to God. It's the smartest thing you can ever do. But the thing is, is that when we, when we build our houses, when we do all of our good stuff, and then we say we don't need God anymore, what happens is we first turn our face, and then we turn our backs. You don't turn your back to turn your face. You turn your face to turn your back. This is the thing that, that has gone on all the way through Scripture. So first the head turns, then the back turns. And it's a repeated story that happens over and over and over and over. I can give you four big causes that the Old Testament is based around, but there are more than that. But what we have to realize is look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. You guys got your, your look into Jesus eyes on? You want to look to Jesus today? Do you want to see something today? Because I want you to see something. You see, Israel now we're getting into the meat of the story Israel has been ambushed have any of you ever been ambushed by the devil Amen. I mean you didn't even see it coming you was going down this path and all of a sudden you got ambushed Israel literally got ambushed and that's a good time to go to God let me tell you, you've been walking with God, you've been keeping your eyes on Jesus, or you've turned your back on God, you get ambushed, come to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Look to Jesus. Find Jesus. That's always a good time. It's a good time to go to God. And in Numbers 21, this is what happened, is they got ambushed, they were on a path, they got ambushed, and the enemy began to destroy them and to kill them. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Numbers 21, verse 2. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Okay, now you, you wonder who these, you know, these people are. Not going to go back into this. You've heard me preach on it before. Jesus said in the last days, you know, just like the days of Lot and the days of Noah, uh, giants had formed in the land because fallen demonic beings had mated had intercourse genesis 6 with women they produced a tribe a race of giants these giants were peculiar they were different the reason they were created and made was to stop the seed in the book of genesis it talks about the seed war you see jesus could not come through unperfect stock in other words if there was a demon in that family lineage it, jesus could not be born and so the devil was trying to stop the lineage of christ and so these demons were having having sex producing these offspring they became the Anakin or the men of renown throughout the Bible and God said absolutely he said destroy them destroy them in other words I'm going to say they were a hybrid they weren't a human they weren't they were a hybrid race and God said to destroy them this is a part of where we come into the Canaanites and all the ites and the you know this is part of that story. And so the word here for destroy is a Hebrew word that means devote the riches to the Lord. And so literally what Moses said is you let us take them and, and we're going to not take the riches for ourselves, but we're going to give the riches all to God. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and he delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of the place was called Horma. Horma is the word for destruction. They called the name of the place, they called it destruction. Now we're going we're gonna to 
note a long time pattern that seems to happen with people is we do good and then we get away from God and then we do good we come back to God and then we get away from God and then we do good again and then we get away from God it's a generational thing stop it don't do that don't be like those people don't do that anymore but there's a very interesting story behind this story one that I truly love some of you have read of it, some of you know about it, some of you it may be entirely new. It's the story about the fiery serpents. The fiery serpents. How many of you have heard about the bronze serpent that was put upon a pole and he was lifted up in the camp? You know, if, you, if you've ever been to a physician's office, you've seen that bronze serpent because it, re it represents medicine in our world today let me read that story to you I'm continuing I'm just in the next verse verse number four it says then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the soul of the people that word soul means the mind the mental condition of the people became very discouraged on the way how many of you realize as I said earlier you're on your way somewhere don't get discouraged you're on your way. I'm on my way. Where, I'm on my way to what? To what my eye hasn't seen, what my ear hasn't heard. I'm on my way from glory to glory as God wants to change me from glory to glory. Don't get discouraged by the things that are around you. You see, he's on the way. Though I walk, the Bible says, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know what? We're not living in the valley. We're not camping in the valley. We're not putting a tent in the valley. We're just passing through the valley. Don't get discouraged by what's around you. Put your eyes on Jesus. And the Bible says here they went around Edom and they got discouraged. And this is what the people did. They began, verse 5, to speak against God and to speak against Moses. And they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there's no food, there's no water, and our soul loathes, absolutely hates this worthless bread. That's the word manna. Manna means what is it? That manna was amazing. That manna was God's, God's bread. Jesus is the bread of life. He provided quail for them. He provided water for them. How many of you realize that if you're not careful, you can begin to curse the very blessings that God has blessed you with? I'm tired of this. I told you all last week the story about the man that called me up. We gave him a turkey. How many of y'all remember that story? I'm going to repeat it real, real quick. He called me up on the phone. We gave him a turkey. And he said, Pastor, he said, I'm tired of that turkey. I said, I want a ham. Send me a ham. <laughs> and I told him, wait a few more days. I said, that turkey will start tasting good again. <laughs> That's a true story. I couldn't believe we gave the man a, like a big old dinner and everything for his whole family and he's complaining about it the next day. How I many you know some people just aren't thankful? Amen. Not thankful for anything. I'm going to tell you, you can't ever, some people you'll never make happy. And so what? Give up. Quit trying to make the devil happy. You're not going to ever make him happy. Amen. That's another, that's a whole other thing. Let me get off of that. And the people spoke against God. They spoke against Moses. We don't like this worthless bread. So the Lord, how many of you thank God that we don't live in that dispensation? Thank God for the dispensation of grace. So the Lord, who does it say? It says, so the Lord, what did the Lord do? He sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people in Israel died. Well, that'll teach you. Now, these fiery serpents, and I don't have details to, to get into all the time, these things were horrible. They were horrendous. They didn't kill you immediately. That would have been great. <laughs> no, these suckers hurt you, tortured you, pained you. You didn't just get bit once. You might be bit multiple times, and it would lead to your death. They're in a bad way. So therefore, in verse 7, the people came to Moses and they said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and we have spoken against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. How many of you know that's a smart thing? How many of you are glad that God doesn't hold grudges against you? I mean, people hold grudges. God doesn't hold grudges. He say, well, well, sirs, you're right. God's not like that. 
Well, let's just let them down there for a week longer, and then I'll think about it. Or, or you know, come talk to me later. They prayed, Moses prayed. In verse number 8, the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, he put it out, and people looked at it, and they all lived. You see, what that bronze serpent represents is how many of you realize Jesus became a curse for us? He wasn't cursed. How many of you realize that we, we are born fallen? We are born. You're born. You're broke before you get here. We're broken people. And it takes God to heal us, to restore us. And so out of our brokenness, we call out to God. Sometimes we don't see our brokenness. See, that's because we're looking in the wrong mirror. Uh, we're looking at the wrong face. We're comparing to the wrong places. But when we understand our brokenness, then we begin to understand that Jesus became broken for us. He took our brokenness. He took our curse. The Bible says, cursed is every man that hangs upon a tree. The Jews said, this can't be the Son of God because he died on a tree. The Jews said, this can't be the Son of God. Look where he was born from. Certainly nothing good will come out of that little town. But you know what? God rises up out of the least of us, out of the least of things, the least of places. And he took that curse and he became that curse. And when you are looking at your curse, you are dying from your curse. You see, in this world, let me tell you, there are things around you in this world that are the curse of you. And when you spend your time... Now, now realize, please, please understand that it's hard to take your eyes off of the serpent that's bit onto your leg. It's hard to take your eyes off of the serpent that's biting at your heels. How many of you realize that it's the little, the Bible says, the little foxes that spoil the vine? How many of you realize the devil is going like this? And you know what? He doesn't have to kill you. All he has to do is distract you. Because what you look at is what you become. Are y'all getting this? What you're face to face with and, and the Bible says, the Word of God says, that if you'll take this serpent and put it upon a pole, how many of you know Jesus was high and lifted up? He died on a tree. He was lifted up so that all the world might be able to see him. But I'm going to tell you, before you see Jesus, you have to take your eyes off of what's killing you here. Now, some of you, you know, you've gone through addictions. You've gone through depression. You've gone through... A whole list man we could just we could just start adding to the list and let me tell you something about that list we would still be here tomorrow adding on to that list but if you'll get your eyes off of your curse and put your eyes on Jesus he'll heal you Jesus came to be that curse Jesus came so that we can touch him Jesus came and in the midst of the world, in the midst of the world, I want to ask you, in the midst, because you're in the midst of the world, in the midst, sometimes it's a mean time, you're in a mean time, in a mean place, in the midst of the world, where are your eyes set? What are you looking at? There's nothing, absolutely nothing good in this world. Nothing, nothing is going to last in this world. It's going to fade away. It's going to pass away. It's going to fail. But there's one thing. You know what's sad is to have thanksgiving and to have nothing to be thankful for. We're sick and tired of that manna. We're sick and tired of this life. We're sick and tired of this way. Well, turn your eyes to Jesus. John, I come back to John. John had one of the most powerful revelations. I want you to realize John, remember John, he's the one that Jesus loved. He's the one that speaks of God as the Father. Now, of course, Jesus said, when you pray, pray, my Father, our Father, which art in heaven. John had a revelation. 
in John chapter 3, and you know this verse so well, but what you might not know is the verses before it. In verse 14 it said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I want you to realize today that your problem, your curse, your despair, your depression, your sadness, your sorrow, it's all been put on a man named Jesus. He took stripes upon his back for your sickness. He took all of our sin, my sin, wasn't just placed upon him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And while those snakes are biting, in the midst of your hard time, in the midst of your depression, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of wherever you are, whatever pit you find yourself in in the midst of the biting if you'll look up if you'll look up and see Jesus if you'll look up how many of us will admit that sometimes it's hard to take our eyes off of the serpent that keeps biting sometimes it's hard because we have a tendency that we first turn our face to look at it and then we turn our backs to God. Lord Jesus, save us, help us, show us your way. That last verse, Numbers 21, 9, the last verse, so Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it on a pole and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. How many of you realize today that God has more life ahead of you than what your eyes seem and what your ears heard? I like to put it like this, your best days are still ahead of you. Amen? I haven't reached my best days. I'm enjoying my days more and more now than I did when I was a young man. I'm coming into my best days. I'm coming into my best season. I'm coming into legacy. I'm coming into those things that God has promised. Man alive, be 18 again? You can have it, man. I don't want to be 18 again. Are you kidding me? I like being 58. <laughs> I'm living my best days. Why? Because I see Jesus and I've learned to press, to trust, to to reach because he's right there in front of me you know what if you're if you're 15 trust Jesus if you're 25 trust Jesus if you're 35 turn your eyes turn your eyes toward Jesus